let's imagine that we're the, the cyber war force for some, well, well let's, let's go the other way because the US wouldn't attack Liechtenstein. Let's pretend Liechtenstein, by the way, if you, for those of you who don't know, Liechtenstein's a country, it's about the size of my pickup truck, it's in, in Europe. It's, uh, its primary export is uh, dental prostheses. Um, but it's a really, really nice place. Dental prostheses and chocolate, excuse me, they make false teeth and chocolate. Uh, they're decided that they're gonna attack the United States. Uh, they've got you know, a cyber war team which consists of a significant percentage of the population. Um, they've spent a couple billion dollars building this up with the money they made from selling their chocolates and they're gonna take out the United States, okay? So D-Day comes along and Microsoft has pushed out a patch that just disabled 20% of our weaponry. Whoops. That's an entirely plausible scenario. Or the other one that would happen is you're there, you're in the, you know, you're in the bunker, uh, the military commanders are there, okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna crash their command and control networks and then, uh, and then the uh, airborne troops are gonna land and take over everything when, in, in the middle of the chaos and, and everything's good and, and, and some intern pushes out a router upgrade which just defeated our secret attack against the routers. So we were relying on this weapon and suddenly the enemy is able to accidentally disarm us. There is no war fighter, there is no military thinker that I've ever run across that has ever existed who would be willing to tolerate a weapon that your enemy can go click and make it disappear. It just won't happen, right? You cannot get the US Marines, for example, to carry a gun that's got a microprocessor in it because the Marines aren't freaking stupid. They're lethal. And a lot of people make jokes about them being stupid, but they're not stupid enough to go into battle with a weapon that can be electronically disabled. That's a huge problem with the notion of cyber war, right? If you're building this huge infrastructure in order to launch an attack against your enemy, and Cisco decides that they're gonna push out a bug fix, your whole weapon systems could be critically degraded right at the moment when you're about to go to war. Now, if you think about the doctrines of nuclear warfare from, from you know, mutual destruction, destruction, assured destruction from the 50s on up through the 80s. One of the biggest concerns was always the availability of your weapon systems. Right? Anything that happened, anything that happened in, in either the US or the Soviet space that could have caused a critical degradation of the ability to launch nuclear weapons at any particular instant would actually trigger a, a potential first strike. Because if you, were sitting there in, if you were sitting there in NORAD and suddenly half of the missile system started to go offline, your, your first reaction is going to be, wait a second, half the missile systems just went offline. Something took them offline. It's probably enemy action. This is preparatory to a first strike. We better launch what we've got while we've got it. It's a simple logic. And every time, if you read any of the, the history of the Cold War, that thinking was all pervasive through all of the mutual assured destruction days. Anything that happened that looked like your weapon systems were suddenly being degraded caused a first strike. And if you made sure your enemy knew that, then they would be extremely careful about not doing anything that would possibly degrade your weapon systems. That's why we get these really weird scenarios, like while the US and the Russians were standing at knife point against each other with hydrogen bombs, you'd get people going, well, we're not gonna ever do anything that would ever possibly jeopardize your spy satellites. Right? It wasn't until the Cold War collapsed that we saw the Chinese demonstra demonstrate anti-satellite capability and then, what, two months later, the U.S. had to demonstrate anti-satellite capability. And personally, I've been shocked that the Russians haven't done it yet, um, which you know, maybe tells me that the Russians were actually even in worse military shape than we thought they were. Anyway, so the point is, anywhere where you can suddenly find yourself unilaterally disarmed by a junior system administrator is bullshit. Okay. Um, there's also the cost factor. Now, the cost factor is simply, uh, I, I don't know any other way to put it. So, in order to take over a network, you have to be able to manage it. Right? There's no difference between taking over a network and being able to remote administer it. So, if you're saying that you're going to go in, again, let's say that the, 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 the mission, we're, we're the cyber war department of the government of Liechtenstein, and our mission is to be able to take out the U.S. government the moment we're told go by, by the central command, right? Essentially, our mission is to be able to remote manage the U.S. government's computer systems. You can think about that one for a second, okay? Any of you built an ISP or built a small network or even a medium-sized network, now imagine that you're supposed to manage remotely a heterogeneous network 
the size of the U.S. Department of Defense's networks, which, by the way, are so, sort of segmented and firewalled and VPN tunneled over each other, all this kind of nonsense, to the point where we have to hire contractors just to figure out what the networks do, never mind actually making them work. These are hugely complicated networks. They're deeply layered. They're mutually opposed in some cases. They're not intercompatible. They're frequently firewalled off from each other. Sometimes they're running different protocols. They're running different operating systems. They're running completely different loadouts of software. And the premise is that somehow we're going to remote manage that from our secure underground bunker in Liechtenstein to the point where we can crash it at a moment's notice. How much would you charge if you were a consultant and you were asked to develop that capability, how much would you charge? Right? Because basically what we're talking about is being able to build, um, you know, unicenter the next generation on ACID, something that can remote manage an entire hostile network and, by the way, is going to correctly detect if the enemy has done something to try to, you know, fix the penetrations that you've put in place. I can't even imagine what kind of tools you would need. Now, obviously, you, you could start thinking about this, if we were going to actually build one of these things, you know, it, it kind of looks like a, a massively distributed botnet of Trojan horses and, you know, all this kind of stuff, right? But we're talking about an insanely difficult technical problem. Now, let's talk about a more practical technical problem. If our mission is to be able to degrade the command and control systems of the United States, wouldn't it be a whole lot better if we had people who worked at contractors and all they have to do is just mess up router configurations at critical moments? Right? That's a whole lot more plausible. Even a whole lot more plausible than that would be simply that you've got, you know, a couple of people who are prepared to just blow up the data center at the right time. If I were in charge of a hostile, where you'd have to be hostile because we're talking acts of war here. Ah, I apologize. Very important point I forgot to make. One of the big distinctions between cyber war and all the other stuff that I was talking about before. Cyber war, we're talking acts of war talking actions that are militarily significant to the point where your target is going to feel justified in sending the U.S. Marine Corps to ferret you out afterwards. Right, so this is not something you want to undertake lightly. And so if I were chartered to set up the cyber war capability for some government that was potentially going to get hostile to the United States, I would be doing crazy things like trying to figure out how to actually you know, construct network operations centers with explosive packages full of ball bearings in the right places, so when we really needed to shut their knockdown, we would just simply blow it up and kill everybody in it. Because, again, anyone who has studied military history and military thinking will tell you that the most crucial part of a weapon system is the highly trained operator. You can blow up the knock, but if you've got the kinds of guys who know how to build a knock in the first place, they're going to be able to get something back up and running. One of the reasons that the Luftwaffe had such terrible problems towards the end of the Second World War was not the lack of availability of planes. The, the, there, was a, there was some problems with air, aircraft parts. The problem was that the pilots had all gotten shot down, and it takes a long time to train a good fighter pilot. Unless you've got a lot of sort of, sort of okay fighter pilots, and you're willing to do a Darwinian process like the Russians did, where you basically stick guys in airplanes and throw them up there, and you assume that the good ones are going to survive which is basically what the, the Red Air Force was at the end of the Second World War. But the Luftwaffe was originally highly trained, highly skilled pilots, and most of them were dead uh, by close to the end of the war, and they essentially the Luftwaffe stopped flying combat operations. Okay? So if what you really wanted to do was to destroy the command and control networks of a target, what you would want to do is kill all the network operators and system administrators. This means that you, network managers, are a military target. Okay, so demand hazard pay if you think you're going to start getting into it with a, a nation state that thinks like I do. All right, the other problem, more serious problem. <clears throat> okay, so the first two were kind of technical problems. Now we're going to shift into just big picture military theory here. Is that packets just don't hold ground. This is obvious. In order for any kind of a military action to have any purpose, you're going to do something involving taking and holding ground or delaying or preventing someone else from taking and holding ground. The entire reason that nations go to war is territorial, right? Or it's conquest. Conquest is just another form of territory. 
right? And there's different ways you can do this. You can say, well, we're not actually going to worry about taking and holding ground. We're just going to wipe everybody out. Once we've wiped them out, then implicitly we can take and hold the ground. But from a standpoint of any kind of useful operations, it's going to involve taking territory. Now, for cyber war, how does that help? How does a bunch of packets help you take and hold ground? It doesn't, right? In order to meaningfully do cyber war, you have to have real soldiers standing by to exploit the degradation or the force multiplication or whatever it is that you want to call it that you've inflicted upon the enemy. So let me put this in real world terms. Again, we're going to pretend we're, you know, we're Liechtenstein. We're getting ready to do a cyber war against the United States. Okay, so we click go on our attack tool, and the U.S. command and control networks completely collapse. There's still 100,000 U.S. Marines to deal with, which is just about the size of the population of Liechtenstein. Okay, that's a big problem. Right? Unless you can actually cause the existing military forces to cease to exist with your packets, um, there's a big problem. You need to have tactical and strategic superiority in order to do the follow through. Now, the important point here, I'm being a little facetious, but the important point here is there's absolutely zero reason, zero benefit why the government of Liechtenstein or pick, pick any small country would bother to develop a cyber war capability, given that. Because they're, they're not stupid. They're going to understand that, right? They crash the US networks, and then <laughs> they get carpet bombed. OK. Um, <clears throat> unless you can take and hold the ground afterwards, there's no point in preparing for war. The only place where you prepare for war, if you can't take and hold ground, is because you're trying to prevent the other guy from taking and holding your ground, in which case you're preparing for a defensive war. Now, let's look at defensive cyber, oper cyber warfare operations. What the hell does a defensive cyber warfare operation look like? It doesn't. If any of you can think of how you might meaningfully do defensive cyber warfare operations, I'd love to know, because I haven't, I've racked my brains and I can't think of it. I suppose you could have it so that when the bad guys attack you, that your data centers blow up so that what? So that they'll bring in their own network managers and build new data centers. Right? I suppose you could delete all of your internet porn before you get conquered. But there's, there's really, joking aside, I suppose you could have all of your intelligence information disappear. Right? There are certain things that I, I guess you could do. But if, if part of your premise is that you're going to get conquered by a foreign power, having your credit card databases get wiped or your tax information get wiped or, or whatever, it seems fairly insignificant compared to the fact that you've simply lost sovereignty. Right? Again, remember, when we're talking cyber war, we're talking at the level of national sovereignty. We're talking about nation states that are taking each other out. It's a big problem. Right? I can't think of how you would want to or prepare to fight a defensive cyber war. That means you could only want to fight an offensive cyber war. And it's only meaningful to fight an offensive cyber warfare if you're the big 900-pound gorilla who's going to win anyway. And that really is the hidden agenda, which is not very hidden in this talk. The, pretty much the only country in the world right now that would have any possibly reasonable reason to try to prepare to fight cyber war would be the United States. The targets could be basically anybody who's not the United States. Um, so cyber war only makes sense to the side that's likely to win anyway. Which brings up another question, which is whether it's effective or not, right? If you're already likely to win, who cares? Let's say we're the United States, we're going to attack Liechtenstein. Why would we bother crashing their network? Because frankly, we've got more Marines that we can put on their streets than they have population in general. I, actually, you could probably just call them up and say, surrender, OK? Um, and, and they would go, yeah, OK, you know, fax us a letter of surrender, and we'll sign it, right? It'd be over in you know, 10 seconds unless they were idiots. And if they were idiots, it would take 20 seconds. Um, <clears throat> and by the way, I, I'm, I'm being a little bit joking about some of this. I am not a militarist. Right? Um, the reason that I, I'm doing this talk is because I'm not a militarist. Uh, I know I'm talking a lot like a militarist, but I actually am trying to show you why this is not a good idea. But I'm a terrified, I'm really terrified, that there are militarists in the United States who are currently spending a lot of money preparing to fight these kind of useless battles. OK, next problem with cyber war is what I call the blind Mike Tyson effect. Right? The blind Mike Tyson effect is, um, is, uh, is named after one of my, my friend's uh, recipes for the ultimate epic fail. The ultimate epic fail is you lock yourself in a room with Mike Tyson, flip the lights out, and say, I'm going to kick your ass, bitch. Right? Um, 
you would pretty much turn into wallpaper. Uh, I, I, they might find pieces of you when he was done with you, 